Antikythera Mechanism from Wikipedia, the free online encyclopedia at www.wikipedia.org. The Antikythera Mechanism is an ancient Greek analog computer used to predict astronomical positions and eclipses for calendar and astrological purposes decades in advance. It could also be used to track the four-year cycle of athletic games, which was similar to an Olympiad, the cycle of the ancient Olympic Games. This artifact was retrieved from the sea in 1901 and identified on the 17th of May 1902 as containing a gear by archaeologist Varios Stace among wreckage retrieved from a wreck off the coast of the Greek island Antikythera. The instrument is believed to have been designed and constructed by Greek scientists and has been variously dated to about 87 BC or between 150 and 100 BC or to 205 BC or to within a generation before the shipwreck which has been dated to approximately 70 to 60 BC. The device, housed in the remains of a 34 cm by 18 cm by 9 cm, 13.4 inch by 7.1 inch by 3.5 inch wooden box, was found as one lump, later separated into three main fragments, which are now divided into 82 separate fragments after conservation works. Four of these fragments contain gears, while inscriptions are found on many others. The largest gear is approximately 14 cm, 5.5 inches in diameter, and originally had 223 teeth. It is a complex clockwork mechanism composed of at least 30 meshing bronze gears. A team led by Mike Edmonds and Tony Freeth of Cardiff University used modern computer X-ray tomography and high-resolution surface scanning to image inside fragments of the crust-encased mechanism and read the faintest inscriptions that once covered the outer casing of the machine. Detailed imaging of the mechanism suggests that it had 37 gear wheels, enabling it to follow the movements of the moon and the sun through the zodiac, to predict eclipses, and even to model the irregular orbit of the moon, where the moon's velocity is higher in its perigee than in its apogee. This motion was studied in the 2nd century BC by astronomer Hipparchus of Rhodes, and it is speculated that he may have been consulted in the machine's construction. The knowledge of this technology was lost at some point in antiquity, and technological works approaching its complexity and workmanship did not appear again until the development of mechanical astronomical clocks in Europe in the 14th century. All known fragments of the Antikythera mechanism are kept at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, along with a number of artistic reconstructions, replicas of how the mechanism may have looked and worked. History. Discovery. Captain Dimitrios Kantos and a crew of sponge divers from Saimi Island discovered the Antikythera shipwreck during the spring of 1900 and recovered artifacts during the first expedition with the Hellenic Royal Navy in 1900-1901. This wreck of a Roman cargo ship was found at a depth of 45 meters, 148 feet, off Point Glyphatia on the Greek island of Antikythera. The team retrieved numerous large artifacts, including bronze and marble statues, pottery, unique glassware, jewelry, coins, and the mechanism. The mechanism was retrieved from the wreckage in 1901, most probably in July of that year. It is not known how the mechanism came to be on the cargo ship, but it has been suggested that it was being taken from Rhodes to Rome, together with other looted treasure, to support a triumphal parade being staged by Julius Caesar. All of the items retrieved from the wreckage were transferred to the National Museum of Archaeology in Athens for storage and analysis. The mechanism appeared at the time to be little more than a lump of corroded bronze and wood. It went unnoticed for two years, while museum staff worked on piecing together more obvious treasures, such as the statues. On the 17th of May, 1902, archaeologist Valerios Stace found that one of the pieces of rock had a gear wheel embedded in it. He initially believed that it was an astronomical clock, but most scholars considered the device to be prochronistic, too complex to have been constructed during the same period as the other pieces that had been discovered. Investigations into the object were dropped until British science historian and Yale University professor Derek J. DeSola Price became interested in it in 1951. In 1971, Price and Greek nuclear physicist Charolampos Karakalos made X-ray and gamma-ray images of the 82 fragments. Price published an extensive 70-page paper on their findings in 1974. Two other searches for items at the Antikythera wreck site in 2012 and 2015 have yielded a number of fascinating art objects and a second ship which may or may not be connected with the treasure ship on which the mechanism was found. Also found was a bronze disc with the image of a bull embellished on it. The disc has four ears which have holes in them, and it was thought by some that it may have been part of the Antikythera mechanism itself as a cog wheel. However, there appears to be little evidence that it was part of the mechanism. It is more likely that the disc was a bronze decoration on a piece of furniture. Origin the Antikythera mechanism is generally referred to as the first known analog computer. The quality and complexity of the mechanism's manufacture suggests that it must have had undiscovered predecessors made during the Hellenistic period. Its construction relied on theories of astronomy and mathematics developed by Greek astronomers during the 2nd century BC, and it is estimated to have been built in the late 2nd century BC or the early 1st century BC. 
In 1974, Derek de Price concluded from gear settings and inscriptions on the mechanism's faces that it was made about 87 BC and lost only a few years later. Jacques Cousteau and associates visited the wreck in 1976 and recovered coins dated between 76 and 67 BC. The mechanism's advanced state of corrosion has made it impossible to perform an accurate compositional analysis, but it is believed that the device was made of a low tin bronze alloy of approximately 95% copper, 5% tin. Its instructions were composed in coin Greek. In 2008, continued research by the Antikythera Mechanism Research Project suggested that the concept for the mechanism may have originated in the colonies of Corinth, since they identified the calendar on the metonic spiral as coming from Corinth or one of its colonies in northwest Greece or Sicily. Syracuse was a colony of Corinth and the home of Archimedes, and the Antikythera Mechanism Research Project argued in 2008 that it might imply a connection with the school of Archimedes. However, it has recently been demonstrated that the calendar on the metonic spiral is indeed of the Corinthian type, but cannot be that of Syracuse. Another theory suggests that coins found by Jacques Cousteau at the wreck site in the 1970s date to the time of the device's construction, and posits that its origin may have been from the ancient Greek city of Pergamon, home of the Library of Pergamum. With its many scrolls of art and science, it was second in importance only to the Library of Alexandria during the Hellenistic period. The ship carrying the device also contained vases in the Rhodian style, leading to a hypothesis that it was constructed at an academy founded by Stoic philosopher Posidonius on that Greek island. Rhodes was a busy trading port in antiquity and a center of astronomy and mechanical engineering, home to astronomer Hipparchus, who was active from about 140 BC to 120 BC. The mechanism uses Hipparchus's theory for the motion of the moon, which suggests the possibility that he may have designed it or at least worked on it. In addition, it has recently been argued that the astronomical events on the parapegma of the Antikythera mechanism work best for latitudes in the range of 33.3 to 37.0 degrees north. The island of Rhodes is located between the latitudes of 35.85 and 36.50 degrees north. In 2014, a study by Carmen and Evans argued for a new dating of approximately 200 BC, based on identifying the startup date on the Saros dial as the astronomical lunar month that began shortly after the new moon of the 28th of April, 205 BC. Moreover, according to Carmen and Evans, the Babylonian arithmetic style of prediction fits much better with the device's predictive models than the traditional Greek trigonometric style. A study by Paul Iverson published in 2017 reasons that the prototype for the device was indeed from Rhodes, but that this particular model was modified for a client from Epirus in northwestern Greece. Iverson argues that it was probably constructed no earlier than a generation before the shipwreck. Further dives were undertaken in 2014, with plans to continue in 2015 in the hope of discovering more of the mechanism. Description The original mechanism apparently came out of the Mediterranean as a single encrusted piece. Soon afterward, it fractured into three major pieces. Other small pieces have broken off in the interim from cleaning and handling, and still others were found on the sea floor by the Cousteau expedition. Other fragments may still be in storage, undiscovered since their initial recovery. Fragment F came to light in that way in 2005. Of the 82 known fragments, seven are mechanically significant and contain the majority of the mechanism and inscriptions. There are also 16 smaller parts that contain fractional and incomplete inscriptions. Major Fragments Fragment A, 180 mm by 150 mm, 369.1 grams, 27 gears, and inscriptions. The main fragment contains the majority of the known mechanism. Clearly visible on the front is the large B1 gear, and under closer inspection, further gears behind said gear, parts of them the L, M, C, and D trains are clearly visible as gears to the naked eye. The crank mechanism socket and the side-mounted gear that meshes with B1 is on fragment A. The back of the fragment contains the rearmost E and K gears for synthesis of the moon anomaly. Noticeable also is the pin and slot mechanism of the K train. It is noticed from detailed scans of the fragment that all gears are very closely packed and have sustained damage and displacement due to their gears in the sea. The fragment is approximately 30 millimeters thick at its thickest point. Fragment A also contains divisions of the upper left quarter of the Cerro spiral and 14 inscriptions from said spiral. The fragment also contains inscriptions for the Exeligmos dial and visible on the back surface the remnants of the dial face. Finally, this fragment contains some back door inscriptions. Fragment B, 125 mm by 60 mm, 99.4 grams, one gear and inscriptions, contains approximately the bottom right third of the metonic spiral and inscriptions of both the spiral and back door of the mechanism. The metonic scale would have consisted of 235 cells, of which 49 have been deciphered from fragment B, either in whole or partially. The rest so far are assumed from knowledge of the metonic cycle. This fragment also contains a single gear, O1, used in the Olympic train. Fragment C, 
120 millimeters by 110 millimeters, 63.8 grams, one gear, and inscriptions. Contains parts of the upper right of the front dial face showing calendar and zodiac inscriptions. This fragment also contains the moon indicator dial assembly, including the moon phase sphere in its housing and a single bevel gear, MA1, used in the moon phase indication system. Fragment D, 45 millimeters by 35 millimeters, 15 grams, one gear, no inscriptions. Contains at least one unknown gear and according to Michael T. Wright, possibly two. Their purpose and position has not been ascertained to any accuracy or consensus, but lends to the debate for the possible planet displays on the face of the mechanism. Fragment E, 60 millimeters by 35 millimeters, 22.1 grams, no gears, and inscriptions. Found in 1976 and contains six inscriptions from the upper right of the Saros spiral. Fragment F, 90 millimeters by 80 millimeters, 86.2 grams, no gears and inscriptions, found in 2005 and contains 16 inscriptions from the lower right of the Saro spiral. It also contains remnants of the mechanism's wooden housing. Remnant G, 125 millimeters by 110 millimeters, 31.7 grams, no gears and inscriptions, a combination of fragments taken from fragment C while cleaning. Minor fragments. Many of the smaller fragments that have been found contain nothing of apparent value. However, a few have some inscriptions on them. Fragment 19 contains significant backdoor inscriptions, including one reading, 76 years, which refers to the Calypic cycle. Other inscriptions seem to describe the function of the back dials. In addition to this important minor fragment, 15 further minor fragments have remnants of inscriptions on them. Mechanism Information on the specific data gleaned from the ruins by the latest inquiries is detailed in the supplement to Freet's 2006 Nature article. Operation On the front face of the mechanism there is a fixed ring dial representing the ecliptic, the twelve zodiacal signs marked off with equal 30 degree sectors. This matched with the Babylonian custom of assigning one twelfth of the ecliptic to each zodiac sign equally, even though the constellation boundaries were variable. Outside of that dial is another ring which is rotatable, marked off with the months and days of the Sophic Egyptian calendar, 12 months of 30 days plus 5 intercalary days. The months are marked with the Egyptian names for the months, described into the Greek alphabet. The first task, then, is to rotate the Egyptian calendar ring to match the current zodiac points. The Egyptian calendar ignored leap days, so it advanced through a full zodiac sign in about 120 years. The mechanism was operated by turning a small hand crank, now lost, which was linked via a crown gear to the largest gear, the four-spoked gear visible on the front of fragment A, the gear named B1. This moved the date pointer on the front dial, which would be set to the correct Egyptian calendar day. The year is not selectable, so it is necessary to know the year currently set, or by looking up the cycles indicated by the various calendar cycle indicators on the back in the Babylonian ephemeris tables for the day of the year currently set, since most of the calendar cycles are not synchronous with the year. The crank moves the date pointer about 78 days per full rotation, so hitting a particular day on the dial would be easily possible if the mechanism were in good working condition. The action of turning the hand crank would also cause all interlocked gears within the mechanism to rotate, resulting in the simultaneous calculation of the position of the sun and moon, the moon phase, eclipse and calendar cycles, and perhaps the location of planets. The operator also had to be aware of the position of the spiral dial pointers on the two large dials on the back. The pointer had a follower that tracked the spiral incisions in the metal as the dials incorporated four and five full rotations of the pointers. When a pointer reached the terminal month location at either end of the spiral, the pointer's follower had to be manually moved to the other end of the spiral before proceeding further. Faces Front face The front dial has two concentric circular scales that represent the path of the ecliptic through the heavens. The outer ring is marked off with the days of the 365-day Egyptian civil calendar. On the inner ring, a second dial marks the Greek signs of the zodiac, with division into degrees. The mechanism predates the Julian calendar reform, but the Sophic and Calypic cycles had already pointed to a 365 and one quarter day solar year, as seen in Ptolemy III's abortive calendrical reform of 238 BC. The dials are not believed to reflect his proposed leap day, but the outer calendar dial may be moved against the inner dial to compensate for the effect of the extra quarter day in the solar year by turning the scale backward one day every four years. The position of the sun on the ecliptic corresponds to the current date in the year. The orbits of the moon and the five planets known to the Greeks are close enough to the ecliptic to make it a convenient reference for defining their positions as well. The following three Egyptian months are inscribed in Greek letters on the surviving pieces of the outer ring, Pachon, Paini, and Epiphy. The other months have been reconstructed, although some reconstructions of the mechanism omit the five days of the Egyptian intercalary month. The zodiac dial contains Greek inscriptions of the members of the zodiac, which is believed to be adapted to the tropical month version rather than the side reel. Krios, Ram, Ares, Tauros, Bull, Taurus, Didymoi, Twins, Gemini, Carcanos, Crab, Cancer, Leon, Lion, 
Leo, Parthenos, Maiden, Virgo, Chelai, Scorpio's Claw, or Zygos, Libra, Scorpios, Scorpion, Scorpio, Toxodes, Archer, Sagittarius, Egocaros, Goat Horned, Capricorn, Hydrocus, Water Carrier, Aquarius, and Ichthyus, Fishes, Pisces. Also on the zodiac dial are a number of single characters at specific points. They are keyed to a parapegma, a precursor of the modern-day almanac inscribed on the front face above and beneath the dials. They mark the locations of longitudes on the ecliptic for specific stars. The parapegma above the dials reads, Alpha, Capricorn begins to rise, and Winter Solstice, Beta, Evening, Gamma, Evening, Delta, Aquarius begins to rise, Epsilon, Evening, Zeta, Evening, Eta, Pisces begins to rise, Iota, Aries begins to rise, and Vernal Equinox, Kappa, Evening, Lambda, the Hyades set in the evening, Mu, Taurus begins to rise, Nu, Lyra rises in the evening, Xi, the Pleiades rise in the morning, Omicron, the Hyades rise in the morning, Pi, Gemini begins to rise, Rho, Altair rises in the evening, and Sigma, Arcturus sets in the morning. The parapegma beneath the dials reads, Alpha, Libra begins to rise, and Autumnal Equinox, Beta, rise in the evening, Gamma, rise in the evening, Delta, rise, Epsilon, Scorpio begins to rise, Iota, Sagittarius begins to rise, Mu, Cancer begins to rise, and Summer Solstice. Nu, Orion precedes the morning, Z, Canis Major precedes the morning, Omicron, Altair sets in the morning, and Pi, Leo begins to rise. At least two pointers indicated positions of bodies upon the ecliptic. A lunar pointer indicated the position of the moon, and a mean sun pointer also was shown, perhaps doubling as the current date pointer. The moon position was not a simple mean moon indicator that would indicate movement uniformly around a circular orbit. It approximated the acceleration and deceleration of the moon's elliptical orbit through the earliest extant use of epicyclic gearing. It also tracked the precision of the elliptical orbit around the ecliptic in an 8.88-year cycle. The mean sun position is, by definition, the current date. It is speculated that since such pains were taken to get the position of the moon correct, then there also was likely to have been a true sun pointer, in addition to the mean sun pointer likewise, to track the elliptical anomaly of the sun, the orbit of Earth around the sun. But there is no evidence of it among the ruins of the mechanism found to date. Similarly, neither is there the evidence of planetary orbit pointers for the five planets known to the Greeks among the ruins. Finally, mechanical engineer Michael Wright has demonstrated that there was a mechanism to supply the lunar phase in addition to the position. The indicator was a small ball embedded in the lunar pointer, half white and half black, which rotated to show the phase, new, first quarter, half, third quarter, full, and back graphically. The data to support this function is available given the sun and moon positions as angular rotations. Essentially, it is the angle between the two, translated into the rotation of the ball. It requires a differential gear, a gearing arrangement that sums or differences two angular inputs. Rear face. In July 2008, scientists reported new findings in the journal Nature, showing that the mechanism not only tracked the metonic calendar and predicted solar eclipses, but also calculated the timing of several Panhellenic athletic games, including the ancient Olympic Games. Inscriptions on the instrument closely match the names of the months that are used on calendars from Epirus in northwestern Greece and with the island of Corfu, which in antiquity was known as Corsera. On the back of the mechanism, there are five dials, the two large displays, the metonic and the saros, and three smaller indicators, the so-called Olympiad dial, which has recently been renamed the Games dial, as it did not track Olympiad years. The four-year cycle it tracks most closely is the Haliad, the Calypic, and the Exaligmos. The metonic dial is the main upper dial on the rear of the mechanism. The metonic cycle, defined in several physical units, is 235 synodic months, which is very close to within less than 13 one millionths to 19 tropical years. It is therefore a convenient interval over which to convert between lunar and solar calendars. The metonic dial covers 235 months in five rotations of the dial, following a spiral track with a follower on the pointer that keeps track of the layer of the spiral. The pointer points to the synodic month counted from new moon to new moon, and the cell contains the Corinthian month names. Phoenikaios, Cranios, Lanotropios, Macanius, Mechanic, referring to Zeus the inventor, Dodecatius, Eucleos, Artemisios, Sidrius, Gamelios, Agrianios, Penemos, and Apollaios. Thus, setting the correct solar time in days on the front panel indicates the current lunar month on the back panel, with resolution to within a week or so. Based on the fact that the calendar month names are consistent with all the evidence of the Epirote calendar, and that the games dial mentions the very minor Na games of Dodona in Epirus, it has recently been argued that the calendar on the Antikythera mechanism is likely to be the Epirote calendar, and that this calendar was probably adopted from a Corinthian colony in Epirus, possibly Ambracia. 
It has also been argued that the first month of the calendar, Phoenikaios, was ideally the month in which the autumn equinox fell, and that the startup date of the calendar began shortly after the astronomical new moon of the 23rd of August, 205 BC. The Calypic dial is the left secondary upper dial, which follows a 76-year cycle. The Calypic cycle is four metonic cycles, and so this dial indicates the current metonic cycle in the overall Calypic cycle. The games dial is the right secondary upper dial. It is the only pointer on the instrument that travels in a counterclockwise direction as time advances. The dial is divided into four sectors, each of which is inscribed with a year indicator and the name of two Panhellenic games, the crown games of Ismia, Olympia, Nemea, and Pythia, and two lesser games, Na, held at Dodona, and the sixth and final set of games recently deciphered as the Heliia of Rhodes. The inscriptions on each one of the four divisions are first year of the cycle, El Alpha, Ismia, and Olympia, year two of the cycle, El Beta, Nemia, and Na, year three of the cycle, El Gamma, Ismia, and Pythia, and year four of the cycle, El Delta, Nemia, and Heliia. The Saros dial is the main lower spiral dial on the rear of the mechanism. The Saros cycle is 18 years and 11 and one-third days long, 6,585.333 days, which is very close to 223 synodic months, 6,585.3211 days. It is defined as the cycle of repetition of the positions required to cause solar and lunar eclipses, and therefore it could be used to predict them not only the month, but the day and time of day. Note that the cycle is approximately eight hours longer than an integer number of days. Translated into global spin, that means an eclipse occurs not only eight hours later, but one-third of a rotation farther to the west. Glyphs in 51 of the 223 synodic month cells of the dial specify the occurrence of 38 lunar and 27 solar eclipses. Some of the abbreviations in the glyphs read moon, sun, of the day, hour, and of the night. The glyphs show whether the designated eclipse is solar or lunar, and give the day of the month and hour. Obviously, solar eclipses may not be visible at any given point, and lunar eclipses are visible only if the moon is above the horizon at the appointed hour. In addition, the inner lines of the cardinal points of the Saros dial indicate the start of a new full moon cycle. Based on the distribution of the times of the eclipses, it has recently been argued that the startup date of the Saros dial was shortly after the astronomical new moon of the 28th of April, 205 BC. The Exelegmos dial is the secondary lower dial on the rear of the mechanism. The Exelegmos dial is a 54-year triple Saros cycle that is 19,756 days long. Since the length of the Saros cycle is to a third of a day, eight hours, so a full Exelegmos cycle returns counting to integer days, hence the inscriptions. The labels on its three divisions are blank or omicron representing the number zero, assumed, not yet observed, eta, number eight, means add eight hours to the time mentioned in the display, and Iota Sigma, number 16, means add 16 hours to the time mentioned in the display. Thus, the dial pointer indicates how many hours must be added to the glyph times of the Saros dial in order to calculate the exact eclipse times. Doors. The mechanism has a wooden casing with a front and a back door, both containing inscriptions. The back door appears to be the instruction manual. On one of its fragments is written 76 years, 19 years, representing the calypic and metonic cycles. Also written is 223 for the Saros cycle. On another one of its fragments, it is written on the spiral subdivisions 235, referring to the metonic dial. Gearing. The mechanism is remarkable for the level of miniaturization and the complexity of its parts, which is comparable to that of 14th century astronomical clocks. It has at least 30 gears, although mechanism expert Michael Wright has suggested that the Greeks of this period were capable of implementing a system with many more gears. There is much debate as to whether the mechanism had indicators for all five of the planets known to the ancient Greeks. No gearing for such a planetary display survives, and all gears are accounted for, with the exception of one 63-toothed gear, R1, otherwise unaccounted for in fragment D. The purpose of the front face was to position astronomical bodies with respect to the celestial sphere along the ecliptic, in reference to the observer's position on the Earth. That is irrelevant to the question of whether that position was computed using a heliocentric or geocentric view of the solar system. Either computational method should and does result in the same position, ignoring ellipticity, within the error factors of the mechanism. The epicyclic solar system of Ptolemy, circa 100 to 170 AD, still 300 years in the future from the apparent date of the mechanism, carried forward with more epicycles and was more accurate predicting the positions of planets than the view of Copernicus, born 1473, died 1543 AD, until Kepler, born 1571, died 1630 AD, introduced the possibility that orbits are ellipses. Evans and others suggest that to display the mean positions of the five classical planets would require only 17 further gears that could be positioned in front of the large driving gear and indicated using individual circular dials on the face. 
Tony Freeth and Alexander Jones have modeled and published details of a version using several gear trains, mechanically similar to the lunar anomaly system, allowing for indication of the positions of the planets as well as synthesis of the sun anomaly. Their system, they claim, is more authentic than Wright's model as it uses the known skill sets of the Greeks of that period and does not add excessive complexity or internal stresses to the machine. The gear teeth were in the form of equilateral triangles, with an average circular pitch of 1.6 millimeters, an average wheel thickness of 1.4 millimeters, and an average air gap between gears of 1.2 millimeters. The teeth probably were created from a blank bronze round using hand tools. This is evident because not all of them are even. Due to advances in imaging and X-ray technology, it is now possible to know the precise number of teeth and size of the gears within the located fragments. Thus, the basic operation of the device is no longer a mystery and has been replicated accurately. The major unknown remains the question of the presence and nature of any planet indicators. A table of the gears, their teeth, and the expected and computed rotations of various important gears follows. The geared functions come from Freeth and others, 2008, and those for the lower half of the table from Freeth and Jones, 2012. The computed values start with one year per revolution for the B1 gear, and the remainder are computed directly from gear teeth ratios. The gears marked with an asterisk are missing, or have predecessors missing, from the known mechanism. These gears have been calculated with reasonable gear teeth counts. Gear X is the year gear. Gear B is the moon's orbit. Gear R is the lunar phase display. Gear N is the metonic pointer. Gear O is the game's dial pointer. Gear Q is the calypic pointer. Gear E is the lunar orbit precession. Gear G is the Saros cycle, and Gear I is the Exeligmos pointer. The following are proposed gearing from the 2012 Freeth and Jones reconstruction. Sun 3 is the true Sun pointer. Mare 2 is the Mercury pointer. Ven 2 is the Venus pointer. Mars 4 is the Mars pointer. Jupe 4 is the Jupiter pointer, and Sat 4 is the Saturn pointer. See chart in article for full list of revolution intervals, mechanism formulas, computed intervals, and gear directions. There are several gear ratios for each planet that result in close matches to the correct values for synodic periods of the planets and the sun. The ones chosen above seem to provide good accuracy with reasonable tooth counts, but the specific gears that may have been used are, and probably will remain, unknown. Known Gear Scheme It is very probable that there were planetary dials, as the complicated motions and periodicities of all planets are mentioned in the manual of the mechanism. The exact position and mechanisms for the gears of the planets is not known. There is no coaxial system, but only for the moon. Fragment D, that is an epicycloidal system, is considered as a planetary gear for Jupiter, or a gear for the motion of the Sun. The Sun gear is operated from the hand-operated crank, connected to gear A1, driving the large, four-spoked mean Sun gear, B1, and in turn, drives the rest of the gear sets. The Sun gear is B1, B2, and B2 has 64 teeth. It directly drives the date mean Sun pointer. There may have been a second true Sun pointer that displayed the Sun's elliptical anomaly. It is discussed below in the Freeth reconstruction. In this discussion, reference is to modeled rotational period of various pointers and indicators. They all assume the input rotation of the B1 gear of 360 degrees corresponding with one tropical year, and are computed solely on the basis of the gear ratios of the gears named. The moon train starts with gear B1 and proceeds through C1, C2, D1, D2, E2, E5, K1, K2, E6, E1, and B3 to the moon pointer on the front face. The gears K1 and K2 form an epicyclic gear system. They are an identical pair of gears that don't mesh, but rather they operate face-to-face, -face, with a short pin on K1 inserted into a slot in K2. The two gears have different centers of rotation, so the pin must move back and forth in the slot. That increases and decreases the radius at which K2 is driven, also necessarily varying its angular velocity, presuming the velocity of K1 is even, faster in some parts of the rotation than others. Over an entire revolution, the average velocities are the same, but the fast slow variation models the effect of the elliptical orbit of the moon, in consequence of Kepler's second and third laws. The modeled rotational period of the moon pointer, averaged over a year, is 27.321 days, compared to the modern length of a lunar sidereal month of 27.32161 days. As mentioned, the pin slot driving of the K1, K2 gears varies the displacement over a year's time, and the mounting of those two gears on the E3 gear supplies a precessional advancement to the ellipticity modeling with a period of 8.8826 years, compared with the current value of precession period of the moon of 8.85 years. The system also models the phases of the moon. The moon pointer holds a shaft along its length, on which is mounted a small gear named R, which meshes to the sun pointer at B0. The connection between B0 and the rest of B is not visible in the original mechanism, so whether B0 is the current date mean sun pointer or a hypothetical true sun pointer is not known. 
The gear rides around the dial with the moon, but is also geared to the sun. The effect is to perform a differential gear operation, so the gear turns at the synodic month period, measuring, in effect, the angle of the difference between the sun and moon pointers. The gear drives a small ball that appears through an opening in the moon pointer's face, painted longitudinally, half white and half black, displaying the faces pictorially. It turns with a modeled rotational period of 29.53 days. The modern value for the synodic month is 29.530589 days. The metonic train is driven by the drivetrain B1, B2, L1, L2, M1, M2, and N1, which is connected to the pointer. The modeled rotational period of the pointer is the length of the 6939.5 days over the whole 5 rotational spiral, while the modern value for the metonic cycle is 6939.69 days. The Olympiad train is driven by B1, B2, L1, L2, M1, M2, N1, N2, and O1, which mounts the pointer. It has a computed modeled rotational period of exactly four years, as expected. Incidentally, it is the only pointer on the mechanism that rotates counterclockwise, all the others rotate clockwise. The Calypic train is driven by B1, B2, L1, L2, M1, M2, N1, M3, P1, P2, and Q1, which mounts the pointer. It has a computed modeled rotational period of 27,758 days, while the modern value is 27,758.8 days. The Saros train is driven by B1, B2, L1, L2, M1, M3, E3, E4, F1, F2, and G1, which mounts the pointer. The modeled rotational period of the Saros pointer is 1,646.3 days in four rotations along the spiral pointer track. The modern value is 1,646.33 days. The Exceligmos train is driven by B1, B2, L1, L2, M1, M3, E3, E4, F1, F2, G1, G2, H1, H2, and I1, which mounts the pointer. The modeled rotational period of the Exceligmos pointer is 19,756 days. The modern value is 19,755.96 days. Apparently, gears M3, N1 through 3, P1 and 2, and Q1 did not survive in the wreckage. The functions of the pointers were deduced from the remains of the dials on the back face, and reasonable, appropriate gearage to fulfill the functions was proposed, and is generally accepted. Proposed Gear Schemes because of the large space between the mean sun gear and the front of the case and the size of and mechanical features on the mean sun gear, it is very likely that the mechanism contained further gearing that either has been lost in or subsequent to the shipwreck or was removed before being loaded onto the ship. This lack of evidence and nature of the front part of the mechanism has led to numerous attempts to emulate what the Greeks of the period would have done, and of course, because of the lack of evidence, many solutions have been put forward. Michael Wright was the first person to design and build a model with not only the known mechanism, but also with his emulation of a potential planetarium system. He suggested that along with the lunar anomaly, adjustments would have been made for the deeper, more basic solar anomaly, known as the first anomaly. He included pointers for this true sun, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, in addition to the known mean sun, current time, and lunar pointers. Evans, Carmen, and Thorndike published a solution with significant differences from Wright's. Their proposal centered on what they observed as irregular spacing of the inscriptions on the front dial face, which to them seemed to indicate an off-center sun indicator arrangement. This would simplify the mechanism by removing the need to simulate the solar anomaly. They also suggested that rather than accurate planetary indication rendered impossible by the offset inscriptions, there would be simple dials for each individual planet showing information such as key events in the cycle of planet, initial and final appearances in the night sky, and apparent direction changes. This system would lead to a much simplified gear system with much reduced forces and complexity as compared to Wright's model. Their proposal used simple meshed gear trains and accounted for the previously unexplained 63-toothed gear in fragment D. They proposed two faceplate layouts, one with evenly spaced dials and another with a gap in the top of the face to account for criticism regarding their not using the apparent fixtures on the B1 gear. They proposed that rather than bearings and pillars for gears and axles, they simply held weather and seasonal icons to be displayed through a window. In a paper published in 2012, Carmen, Thorndike, and Evans also proposed a system of epicyclic gearing with pin and slot followers. Freeth and Jones published their proposal in 2012 after extensive research and work. They came up with a compact and feasible solution to the question of planetary indication. They also proposed indicating the solar anomaly, that is, the sun's apparent position in the zodiac dial, on a separate pointer from the date pointer, which indicates the mean position of the sun, as well as the date on the month dial. If the two dials are synchronized correctly, their front panel display is essentially the same as Wright's. Unlike Wright's model, however, this model has not been built physically and is only a 3D computer model. The system to synthesize the solar anomaly is very similar to that used in Wright's proposal. 
three gears, one fixed in the center of the B1 gear and attached to the sun spindle, the second fixed on one of the spokes, in their proposal the one on the bottom left, acting as an idle gear, and the final positioned next to that one. The final gear is fitted with an offset pin, and over said pin, an arm with a slot that in turn is attached to the sun spindle, inducing anomaly as the mean sun wheel turns. The inferior planet mechanism includes the sun, treated as a planet in this context, Mercury and Venus. For each of the three systems, there is an epicyclic gear whose axis is mounted on B1. Thus, the basic frequency is the Earth year, as it is, in truth, for epicyclic motion in the Sun and all the planets, excepting only the Moon. Each meshes with a gear grounded to the mechanism frame. Each has a pin mounted, potentially on an extension of one side of the gear that enlarges the gear, but doesn't interfere with the teeth. In some cases, the needed distance between the gear's center and the pin is farther than the radius of the gear itself. A bar with a slot along its length extends from the pin toward the appropriate coaxial tube, at whose other end is the object pointer, out in front of the front dials. The bars could have been full gears, although there is no need for the waste of metal, since the only working part is the slot. Also, using the bars avoids interference between the three mechanisms, each of which are set on one of the four spokes of B1. Thus, there is one new grounded gear, one was identified in the wreckage, and the second is shared by two of the planets, one gear used to reverse the direction of the sun anomaly, three epicyclic gears, and three bars coaxial tubes pointers, which would qualify as another gear each, five gears and three slotted bars in all. The superior planet systems, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, all follow the same general principle of the lunar anomaly mechanism. Similar to the inferior systems, each has a gear whose center pivot is on an extension of B1 and which meshes with a grounded gear. It presents a pin and a center pivot for the epicyclic gear, which has a slot for the pin, and which meshes with a gear fixed to a coaxial tube, and thence to the pointer. Each of the three mechanisms can fit within a quadrant of the B1 extension, and they are thus all on a single plane parallel with the front dial plate. Each one uses a ground gear, a driving gear, a driven gear, and a gear coaxial tube pointer, thus 12 gears additional in all. In total, there are eight coaxial spindles of various nested sizes to transfer the rotations in the mechanism to the eight pointers. So, in all, there are 30 original gears, 7 gears added to complete calendar functionality, 17 gears and 3 slotted bars to support the 6 new pointers for a grand total of 54 gears, 3 bars, and 8 pointers in Freeth and Jones' design. On the visual representation Freeth supplies in the paper, the pointers on the front zodiac dial have small, round, identifying stones. He mentions a quote from an ancient papyrus, quote, a voice comes to you speaking, let the stars be set upon the board in accordance with their nature except for the sun and moon, and let the sun be golden, the moon silver, Kronos, Saturn of obsidian, Aries, Mars of reddish onyx, Aphrodite, Venus, lapis lazuli veined with gold, Hermes, Mercury, turquoise, let Zeus, Jupiter, be of whitish stone, crystalline, etc. End quote. Accuracy Investigations by Freeth and Jones reveal that their simulated mechanism is not particularly accurate, the Mars pointer being up to 38 degrees off at times. This is not due to inaccuracies in gearing ratios in the mechanism, but rather to inadequacies in the Greek theory. The accuracy could not have been improved until first Ptolemy put forth his planetary hypotheses in the second half of the 2nd century AD, and then the introduction of Kepler's second law in the early 17th century. Quote, in short, the Antikythera mechanism was a machine designed to predict celestial phenomena according to the sophisticated astronomical theories current in its day, the sole witness to a lost history of brilliant engineering, a conception of pure genius, one of the great wonders of the ancient world, but it didn't really work very well." End quote. In addition to theoretical accuracy, there is the matter of mechanical accuracy. Freeth and Jones note that the inevitable looseness in the mechanism due to the hand-built gears with their triangular teeth and the frictions between gears and in bearing surfaces probably would have swamped the finer solar and lunar correction mechanisms built into it. Quote, Though the engineering was remarkable for its era, recent research indicates that its design conception exceeded the engineering precision of its manufacture by a wide margin, with considerable cumulative inaccuracies in the gear trains, which would have cancelled out many of the subtle anomalies built into its design." End quote. While the device itself may have struggled with inaccuracies due to the triangular teeth being handmade, the calculations used and the technology implemented to create the elliptical paths of the planets and retrograde motion of the Moon and Mars by using a clockwork-type gear train with the addition of a pin and slot mechanism predated that of the first known clocks found in antiquity in medieval Europe by more than a thousand years. Archimedes' development of the approximate value of pi and his theory of centers of gravity along with the steps he made towards developing the calculus all suggest that the Greeks had access to more than enough mathematical knowledge beyond that of just Babylonian algebra in order to be able to model the elliptical nature of planetary motion. Quote, 
Of special delight to physicists, the moon mechanism uses a special train of bronze gears, two of them linked with a slightly offset axis to indicate the position and phase of the moon. As is known today from Kepler's laws of planetary motion, the moon travels at different speeds as it orbits the Earth, and this speed differential is modeled by the Antikythera mechanism, even though the ancient Greeks were not aware of the actual elliptical shape of the orbit. Similar devices in ancient literature Cicero's De Republica, a 1st century BC philosophical dialogue, mentions two machines that some modern authors consider as some kind of planetarium or orary, predicting the movements of the sun, the moon, and the five planets known at that time. They were both built by Archimedes and brought to Rome by the Roman general Marcus Claudius Marcellus after the death of Archimedes at the siege of Syracuse in 212 BC. Marcellus had great respect for Archimedes, and one of these machines was the only item he kept from the siege. The second was placed in the Temple of Virtue. The device was kept as a family heirloom, and Cicero had Philus, one of the participants in a conversation that Cicero imagined had taken place in a villa belonging to Scipio Aemilianus in the year 129 BC, saying that Gaius Sulpicius Gallus, consul with Marcellus's nephew in 166 BC, and credited by Pliny the Elder as the first Roman to have written a book explaining solar and lunar eclipses, gave both a learned explanation and a working demonstration of the device. Quote, I had often heard this celestial globe or sphere mentioned on account of the great fame of Archimedes. Its appearance, however, did not seem to me particularly striking. There is another more elegant in form, and more generally known, molded by the same Archimedes, and deposited by the same Marcellus, in the Temple of Virtue at Rome. But as soon as Gallus had begun to explain, by his sublime science, the composition of this machine, I felt that the Sicilian geometrician must have possessed a genius superior to anything we usually conceive to belong to our nature. Gallus assured us that the solid and compact globe was a very ancient invention, and that the first model of it had been presented by Thales of Miletus, that afterwards Eudoxus of Cnidus, a disciple of Plato, had traced on its surface the stars that appear in the sky, and that many years subsequent, borrowing from Eudoxus this beautiful design and representation, Artidas had illustrated them in his verses, not by any science of astronomy, but the ornament of poetic description. He added that the figure of the sphere, which displayed the motions of the sun and moon and the five planets, or wandering stars, could not be represented by the primitive solid globe, and that in this, the invention of Archimedes was admirable because he had calculated how a single revolution should maintain unequal and diversified progressions in dissimilar motions. When Gallus moved this globe, it showed the relationship of the moon with the sun, and there were exactly the same number of turns on the bronze device as the number of days in the real globe of the sky. Thus, it showed the same eclipse of the sun as in the globe of the sky, as well as showing the moon entering the area of the Earth's shadow when the sun is in line, as in it showed both solar and lunar eclipses." End quote. Pappus of Alexandria stated that Archimedes had written a now lost manuscript on the construction of these devices entitled On Sphere Making. The surviving texts from the Library of Alexandria describe many of his creations, some even containing simple drawings. One such device is his odometer, the exact model later used by the Romans to place their mile markers, described by Vitruvius, Heron of Alexandria, and in the time of Emperor Commodus. The drawings in the text appeared functional, but attempts to build them as pictured had failed. When the gears pictured, which had square teeth, were replaced with gears of the type in the Antikythera mechanism, which were angled, the device was perfectly functional. Whether this is an example of a device created by Archimedes and described by texts lost in the burning of the Library of Alexandria, or if it is a device based on his discoveries, or if it has anything to do with him at all, is debatable. If Cicero's account is correct, then this technology existed as early as the 3rd century BC. Archimedes' device is also mentioned by later Roman era writers such as Lactantius, Divinarum Institutionum Libri 7, Claudian, In Sferum Archimedes, and Proclus, commentary on the first book of Euclid's Elements of Geometry in the 4th and 5th centuries. Cicero also said that another such device was built recently by his friend Posidonius, quote, each one of the revolutions of which brings about the same movement in the sun and moon and five wandering stars, planets, as it brought about each day and night in the heavens, end quote. It is unlikely that any one of these machines was the Antikythera mechanism found in the shipwreck, since both the devices fabricated by Archimedes and mentioned by Cicero were located in Rome at least 30 years later than the estimated date of the shipwreck, and the third device was almost certainly in the hands of Posidonius by that date. The scientists who have reconstructed the Antikythera mechanism also agree that it was too sophisticated to have been a unique device. This evidence that the Antikythera mechanism was not unique adds support to the idea that there was an ancient Greek tradition of complex mechanical technology that was later, at least in part, transmitted to the Byzantine and Islamic worlds, where mechanical devices which were complex, albeit simpler than the Antikythera mechanism, were built during the Middle Ages. Fragments of a geared calendar attached to a sundial from the 5th or 6th century Byzantine Empire have been found. The calendar may have been used to assist in telling time. 
In the Islamic world, Banu Musa's Kitab al-Hiyal, or Book of Ingenious Devices, was commissioned by the Caliph of Baghdad in the early 9th century AD. This text described over a hundred mechanical devices, some of which may date back to ancient Greek texts preserved in monasteries. A geared calendar similar to the Byzantine device was described by the scientist Al-Biruni around 1000, and a surviving 13th century astrolabe also contains a similar clockwork device. It is possible that this medieval technology may have been transmitted to Europe and contributed to the development of mechanical clocks there. Popular Culture On the 17th of May, 2017, Google marked the 115th anniversary of the discovery with a doodle. As of 2012, the Antikythera mechanism was displayed as part of a temporary exhibition about the Antikythera shipwreck, accompanied by reconstructions made by Ioannis Theophanidis, Derek de Sola Price, Michael Wright, the Thessaloniki University, and Dionysios Criaris. Other reconstructions are on display at the American Computer Museum in Bozeman, Montana, at the Children's Museum of Manhattan in New York, at Astronomische Physikalis Kabinet in Kassel, Germany, and at the Musée des Arts et Métiers in Paris. The National Geographic documentary series Naked Science had an episode dedicated to the Antikythera mechanism entitled Star Clock BC that aired on the 20th of January 2011. A documentary, The World's First Computer, was produced in 2012 by the Antikythera mechanism researcher and filmmaker Tony Freeth. In 2012, BBC4 aired The 2,000-Year-Old Computer. It was also aired on the 3rd of April, 2013, in the United States on NOVA, the PBS science series, under the name Ancient Computer. It documents the discovery and 2005 investigation of the mechanism by the Antikythera Mechanism Research Project. A fully functioning LEGO reconstruction of the Antikythera Mechanism was built in 2010 by hobbyist Andy Carroll and featured in a short film produced by Small Mammal in 2011. Several exhibitions have been staged worldwide, leading to the main Antikythera shipwreck exhibition at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, Greece. A fictionalized version of the device was a central plot point in the film Stonehenge Apocalypse, 2010, where it was used as the artifact that saved the world from impending doom. Eric von Daniken, in his 1968 book Chariots of the Gods, presented it as one of the many evidences of ancient aliens visiting Earth and leaving behind technology. See also Antikythera Wreck, Archimedes Palimpsest, Astrarium, Astrolabe, Automaton, Tesebius, Hero of Alexandria, Orary, and Reverse Engineering. This audio was recorded on July 12, 2019.